Good morning. Uh, so I'm going to be talking. Sorry, back up. My name is Matthew Garris. I work at Google on uh, various things related to Linux security. And today I'm going to be talking about some of the ways we're looking at making use of EVM, IMA, and Linux security modules to sort of tie these into a cohesive policy that satisfies our use cases. I'm going to be talking to some extent about things that Mimi already brought up, but providing a bit more context about why we're interested in working on them and what we're hoping to gain as a result of this functionality. So some context here. We employ quite a lot of developers. And those developers largely end up at some point in their day-to-day -day work using Linux systems. And we would like those Linux systems to have reasonably strong security guarantees. But unfortunately, somewhat inherent in the role of being a developer is the bit where you build some software and then try to run it. And if your security model is based around only allowing explicitly trusted binaries to execute, then that's going to make it more difficult for developers to do their job. So there's two ways of thinking about this. The first would be, OK, we could block stuff for everyone who's not a developer and then allow developers to uh, run anything they want. That's not ideal because developers are not actually, it turns out, particularly better than the average user in terms of not downloading random files from the internet and clicking on them. <laughs> Developers are not themselves inherently more trustworthy just because they know how to write code. In fact, many of our security problems are, it turns out, down to developers writing code. So um, another way of thinking about it is that we could be more secure if we did stop the developers doing any development. But that's not really within the range of solutions I'm allowed to advocate for. But even if you do restrict things to signed binaries, you're still left with the problem of, well, you can't sign data files and enforce signatures there. If people are using a computer, you're generating files, you're going to need to be able to open those files at some point. So you need to allow for unsigned files that are not executable. But then when it comes to interpreted languages, uh, how do you handle this? Is a script, a Python script, is fundamentally just a data file that you feed to the Python executable, and then it executes it. And we can't remove Python because a lot of infrastructure is based around Python. And even if we could, you're still left with shell scripts, and removing the shell is really not an option. So we've got this whole set of interpreted languages that will happily either read data files or, in many cases, even take code from standard I.O., or even worse, take code as an argument to them. And we can't deal with that with size binaries, so we need another approach. Linux security modules help us a lot here. It's the reason that we are concerned about the sanctity of code in terms of uh, it not being modifiable, it being something that we can say is reasonably trustworthy, is because we, don't, we trust that code not to do malicious things. If instead we're able to say, OK, uh, nothing can do malicious things regardless of whether it wants to or not, then the situation is much easier. We don't need to get into the same situation of having to ensure that only trusted code runs if even untrusted code can't do any damage. So we can use Linux security modules like uh, SE Linux, AppArmor, Smack, Tomoyo, the entire set of families, to restrict what applications can do. And we can split this into two sort of broad categories. We can say, OK, trusted applications should be able to do basically anything, because we assume that some things, there are some things that some applications need to do, but which we don't want arbitrary code to be able to do. For instance, if we have credentials on a system that provide access to other systems, we only want trusted code to be able to access those credentials, but we still want untrusted code to be runnable on the system. 
So we could write an app arm policy that has, or an SE Linux policy or whatever, that has some mechanism to differentiate between applications that are considered trustworthy and applications that are not considered trustworthy. And then, based on those two policies, trustworthy applications get access to credentials. Untrusted applications do not get access to credentials. But how do we tell the difference between a trustworthy application and an untrusted application? Small tangent here. Uh, IMA, Integrity Management Architecture, as Mimi mentioned, is a mechanism that was initially something that generated measurements of files, largely executables, but you can configure it so that it measures all files that are accessed by different processes. IMA appraisal was a later addition to the IMA feature set, which allows validation of that measurement against a stored hash, and either a stored hash or a stored digital signature. If you have an IMA policy that says that IMA should appraise a file or executable under a specific set of circumstances, the kernel will then perform a measurement of the file, compare that to the hash or to the digital signature, and then block access if that measurement does not correspond to the store's copy. So this is the mechanism by which we could sign executables, which, as I said, we can't do in all cases. We cannot say appraise all executables and then only allow executables to run if they have a valid signature, because we do need to allow the untrusted binaries to run as well, and those will not have a signature. The one problem around IMA in this respect, well, so, another slight tangent. IMA only protects the contents of a file. If I modify the file contents, then the IMA measurements will change, the signature will no longer validate, and IMA will either warn or block access to that file as a result. But the file contents are not the only security relevant part of a file. The other aspects include things like the file permissions. If an executable is set you it, it may behave differently to if it's not. And if I add the set UID bit to an executable, that's going to change my assumptions about that executable's security. But IMA is still going to be fine with this because the measurements of the file contents itself have not changed. Similarly, the security.se Linux extended attribute will determine what context an executable will run in or will determine which processes are able to access that file. And if I modify that, then again, the context under which that, the security context of that process will now be different, the security context in that file will now be different, and again, IMA will not care. So EVM protects the file metadata. EVM adds an additional attribute which then uh, contains a signature over either a signature or an HMAC over the metadata. And then you can configure the kernel so that as well as validating the IMA signature or hash, it will also verify that the EVM attribute corresponds to the other security relevant metadata of the file. That's way, if the metadata is tampered with, EVM will fail to validate. If the file contents are tampered with, IMA will fail to validate. EVM was not, this time 18 months ago, EVM was not quite usable for what we wanted to do. EVM signatures included, as Mimi mentioned, the file inode, which is a reasonable thing to do for certain use cases. But unfortunately, you can't know ahead of time, outside very constrained circumstances, which inode a file is going to end up on if you're distributing a package that hasn't yet been installed. So that meant we could ship pre-computed IMA signatures alongside a file, but we could not ship pre-computed EVM signatures, which meant we couldn't automatically handle the cases where we want to protect the metadata. So we've now added 
support for a portable IMA signature, sorry, a portable EVM signature, one which only um, includes a subset of the information that the full EVM signatures would include, but which is something that can be calculated using only the information you know ahead of time, rather than information you only get at the point where the package is installed. The other change we made in terms of the EVM signatures themselves is adding support for signatures that were more than a signed copy of the SHA-1 digest of the file. Um, the reasoning there is that SHA-1 is absolutely fine as the basis for an HMAC. There's no reason at this point to think that the use of SHA-1 there is weak. On the other hand, we are now at the point where attacks on SHA-1 in the more general case are becoming more of a concern and the potential ability for someone to come up with a pre computed attack where they're able to modify a file and still have the same SHA-1. Probably still not at the point where it's realistic, but it's probably also the case that if you're beginning to deploy this stuff, you want something that's a little more future-proof. So we reworked the EVM hashing code a little to add support for using additional hashes rather than just SHA-1. So the next step was how do we tie these two things together? How do we say, okay, signed files, we can take the files that we believe are trustworthy and we can sign those, but how do we then say these files should be allowed to run with elevated privileges and other files should not? And the work we've done here uh, is associated with AppArmor because that's what we're using for enforcement. Uh, you can come up with similar approaches for, well, SE Linux is more straightforward because you already have an extended attribute that's the basis for policy attachment. For AppArmor, previously, policy attachments was based on the path of a file. And the problem with that is if you say, okay, my trusted files all get installed into, you know, slash user slash bin slash user slash sbin. We can write an app arm policy that says stuff there is trustworthy. If I then copy a file into there, it'll be considered trustworthy, which is kind of not what we were aiming for. So the way we're doing this is to add supports to app armor to allow profile attachments to also be based on the presence or contents of extended attributes. And this means that we can write an app armor policy that says if this file has the security.evm extended attribute, this profile should attach. And then that profile is considered a better match than one that is equivalent but doesn't have the extended attribute mentioned. So we do that and then trusted files have the security.evm attribute. They run in the trustworthy app armor profile. Everything that doesn't have that attribute runs in the untrusted state. The IMA policy is then configured to only appraise files that are running in the trusted profile rather than the untrusted one. So if you build something that is you build something locally, it does not have a signature, therefore it runs in the untrusted profile, therefore IMA ignores it as far as appraisal is concerned. You install something from a package, we've built that in our build system, we've determined that this is a trustworthy executable, it has the security.evm extended attribute, it is then run in the trusted profile by AppArmor, and IMA then performs an appraisal. So if you take a file, that has the security.evm extended attributes and you modify it, then the IMA appraisal will fail and execution will be blocked. Except this didn't quite work. Uh, AppArmor, sorry, IMA has various points where you can trigger an appraisal or a measurement. And BPRM check was the one that corresponded to executing a file. <coughs> The problem here was that the appraisal and measurement were taking place early in execution. 
at the point where the files initially read off disk. And that happens before the new credentials are committed, which meant that the LSM context was still that of the parent process. It was not the context that the process would actually end up executing as. So we added a new additional creds check function to IMA to say, OK, perform the appraisal after the credentials have been committed. So this allows you to say, I want everything that is running in this context. Sorry, I want everything that is run by a process in this context to be appraised. That's what BPRM check does. I want everything that will be running in this context to be appraised is what creds check does. So it's a non-obvious difference, but it's actually meaningful. Uh, yeah, the kernel code for all of this stuff is kind of terrifying. I wish I didn't know about this now. The things we do. So uh, this is what an IMA policy in this case looks like. It's very straightforward. We say appraise at the point of the credentials being committed, anything that is running in the trusted underscore exec app armor profile. Anything that's not running in that profile does not get appraised. So this way, anything that is running in the trusted profile has a signature. The signature will be validated. Attempting to run in the trusted profile without having a valid signature will result in execution being blocked by IMA. If you remove the signature, then the file will be run in the untrusted context and will therefore not be able to touch various bits of sensitive material. Interpreted languages are still a tricky problem here because Python as shit comes from, for instance, comes from our repository of trusted files. We don't, we haven't gone through there and then special case the build system so that interpreted languages, sorry, language interpreters get the signatures left off. So the approach we're taking at the moment is to uh, make use of the security.apparmor extended attributes. And right now, our build system just inserts the path, the full path of the executable in the package into the security.apparmor extended attributes. The security.apparmor extended attributes is now part of the EVM signature. So modifying that will fail. And then we write additional AppArmor policy for language interpreters that lists, that attaches to the contents of the security.appArmor extended attribute. So we can say, if this executable is user bin Python 2.7, run it in the untrusted tier. And if you rename the file, it will still bind because the, we're binding to the xasser, not to the actual path name. The security.hammer xasser will still contain the same value. If you modify that, the signature will no longer validate and execution will be blocked. So that way we can force all the language interpreters down to the untrusted tier without having to special case stuff in the build system. Magically, <laughs> scripts still work because the policy transition is determined when a process is initially executed and stuff that has a shebang line is very, very, very magic indeed. The policy you run as is whatever policy is associated with the script, not the script's interpreter. I'm not certain that this behavior is meaningfully documented as guaranteed. Uh, so I have not spent enough time reading this code to be absolutely certain that I can depend on this behavior. But right now, this is the behavior, and it's fine. So, And if anybody changes it now, they'll be breaking user space. <laughs> so what could go wrong? We can make this even more complicated. Uh, so as Mimi mentions, there's now support for, at runtime, writing into a attribute in uh, SysFS, sorry, in SecurityFS, 
to say, I would like additional extended attributes to be protected by the EVM signatures. So upfront, you pre-compute the signature, including this extended attribute. Signature validation will then fail until you tell the kernel, by the way, include this additional extended attribute in the digest. Which means we can add metadata. For instance, packages that go into our build system come from various different sources. We can add additional metadata that indicates which, which input path those binaries came from. We could even add support for which user triggered this build. And that means that we can come up with even finer green security policy that says, OK, this is signed because it came through our build system. But the upload path for this is not as trustworthy as the upload path for something else. Therefore, even though it has a valid signature, it should be run in the untrusted context. And that way, we can do stuff that is, so for stuff that's an experimental build, we could potentially put stuff somewhere in the middle. It's we trust this more than we trust something that was built locally because we have a full audit trail of the source code that was built. But this is built from experimental code. We don't want to say it's as trustworthy as something that wasn't experimental. We build quite large binaries in some cases. Some of the binaries that we deal with are on the order of 500 megabytes. Uh, Go is an amazing language. <laughs> but more realistically, debug symbols add a lot to this. And debug symbols are still part of what's being measured here. This is reasonably expensive as a one-off cost. But if it's on a local file system, then IMA will trust that the file has not been manipulated in the meantime and uh, will not rehash it until the file system informs us that it's been changed by bumping the I version field in the file metadata. Fuse, we can't rely on the Fuse file systems to do that. And therefore, on every open, the file is rehashed. And if you're pulling that 500 megabytes over the network in the background, that's really expensive. One thing here is that even if Fuse is reperforming the measurement on every open of a file, if the Fuse file system is malicious, it's still possible to circumvent this measurement. The Fuse file system can return one set of results the first time you read it while you're doing the hashing and can then return something different for all future reads. And there's no guarantee that the copy that was read up front is the copy that will always be run because the kernel may end up pushing chunks of that code out of RAM and then pulling them off the file system again later. And if the file system gives a different result the second time, then a sufficiently carefully malicious file system could give you something that matched the signature, but which then ended up triggering unmeasured code, malicious code, at a later point. So we're already placing some trust in the Fuse file system. In a universe where you are trusting that IMA will get valid measurements, you probably don't want to be placing too much faith in untrusted Fuse file systems. You probably want to be ensuring that the file systems you're running are trusted. If the file system you're using is trusted, can we make use of that trust to improve performance. One way we could do that is to say, well, we wrote all the data to the file system at some point. The file system got all that data. The file system could generate the hash at that point, and we could then retrieve the hash at a later point. And you can come up with situations where this isn't just necessarily about fuse. You can come up with situations where you have some other mechanism on a local file system for ensuring that a hash is protected. And then uh, what we did here was, and this is very much not upstream yet, add an additional VFS hook that file systems can optionally provide that allows you to ask the file system to give you the hash of a file. And then we've plumbed that through Fuse, so then a Fuse file system can optionally implement this. The problem there is that you don't want this to be achievable for file systems you don't trust. So um, 
in this case, what we're looking at doing is adding support in, so far we've only been looking at AppArmor. AppArmor allows you to restrict processes abilities to mount stuff based on the file system type. So you can say only certain types of process can mount fused file systems. Fused file systems actually add a sub file system type, a file system subtype. And we would like to extend stuff so that we can say, okay, only stuff with fuse, sorry, things with fuse dot magic file system can only be mounted by trusted processes. And then extend IMA so that we can say appraise stuff, or, sorry, allow stuff that is being executed off something that is fuse dot magic file system to make use of this shortcut rather than hashing the file ourselves on every access. If we trust the file system, we trust the file system to return consistent results. If we trust the file system to return consistent results, we should probably be able to trust the file system to also return the correct hash rather than start lying to us in this specific case. As Mimi mentioned, there's still some difficulty in distributing signatures uh, in Debian packages. I've been working with the dpackage upstream to add support for uh, Debian would like to have a generalized way to distribute and store file metadata within packages. So not just about the signatures, but then having a centralized store of all the file metadata and then be able to compare that against the file system. This would also give a better way of distributing file capabilities, which Debian packages otherwise right now require you to set up in the package post inst, which means that in order to be able to calculate the EVM signature in advance, you need to parse the post inst to figure out which file system capabilities are going to be added to a file, which is really not ideal. Uh, so working with dpackage upstream to add that, we now have an implementation, but it turns out there's some awkward corner cases that we're still working through that are going to slow this down a bit more. So still some work to do there. So the uh, summary of this, we're able to tie the app armor context that a process will run in to the content or presence of an extended attribute. We can then protect that extended attribute with EVM. We can protect the file contents with IMA. We can trigger appraisal based on it only running on in the privileged context. And then untrusted code will still run, but will run in an untrusted context, which is not appraised, but which does not have access to the same set of sensitive material. And that's it. So uh, I think if we've got any questions, a couple of minutes. Questions? Could you tell us something more about the overhead of all that? Okay, what is the overhead of all of this? Um, the answer is actually minimal. We're already using IMA measurement. So the expensive part of this is uh, reading the file and generating the hash. We're already doing that. Adding a signature validation to that is very cheap in comparison. So for our specific use case, overhead is tiny. More questions? So you're using uh, trusted and untrusted as far as your subject attributes. Mm -hmm. uh, any thought to using a hierarchy of trust or what, or any other kind of finer granularity than yes and yeah. no? So there are certainly arguments for introducing additional tiers, having a entire spectrum of what we consider in terms of a file. but. One aspect of this design is also to keep things as easy to understand as possible, as maintainable, as maintainable as possible. We didn't want to create a security model which requires many years of experience to understand because that just results in people making, if people misunderstand stuff and are trying to fix bugs, then it's not always the case that whoever initially implemented this is still going to be around. You don't want to require uh, like the whole don't, if code is, if the code you're writing is at the point where you just understand what you're writing, 
it's going to be basically impossible for anybody else to debug that. And we wanted to keep things at a fairly simple, straightforward level so that it was as debuggable as possible and as maintainable as possible. If we end up needing additional complexity, then we'll look at adding more stuff. But right now, this is where we are. More questions? Is there some online resources to try and reproduce and test your approach? Uh, are there online tools? Um, no. <laughs> so part of this is that um, the build system we have is tied to our internal infrastructure. So the code from there is not particularly usable in a general sense. The code that I'm using to generate signatures is uh, available on GitHub. And uh, it's actually being maintained by uh, someone outside the company. So I can't remember the URL offhand, but if you drop me an email, I can send you a link to that. That the code for generating the IMA signatures only requires a small extension to be able to generate EVM signatures as well. Outside that, all the functionality I'm talking about is in the upstream kernel. Although right now the Useland app armor tooling doesn't yet have support for adding the um, policy attachment stuff. We've got a sort of hard-coded thing right now for handling that and uh, working on adding support for that. Question at the front there? So what would stop some malicious um, code from removing the EVM? What would stop some uh, malicious code from re removing yeah. the EVM? Uh, nothing. So if malicious code is running as root, it could remove the security.evm extended attribute, at which point, if you attempted to run that, it would run in the untrusted context. So that's fine. You've successfully said, OK, I'm going to downgrade this file and then tamper with it so that it now runs malicious code. But it now runs in the untrusted tier, and as a result, it should not be able to do damage or obtain sensitive material. It's basically equivalent to, I built a malicious file myself, or I downloaded a malicious file myself from somewhere else, and then ran it. More questions? Um, so uh, you use the extended attribute to attach the AppArmor policy instead of the path, mm -hmm. using the path. So is there an additional privilege that is required to add the security AppArmor extended attribute as opposed to moving a file into US, USR bin? Uh, so security, technically, yes, in that um, you need to be root to modify the security extended attributes, and you don't necessarily need to be root to move stuff into user SBIN. But it's not, you can add the security.appArmor extended attribute. If you do that, it will then run in the trusted tier, but it will then also trigger appraisal. So if you added that attribute, or if you modified that attribute, if the file previously has an EVM signature, it will no longer validate. And therefore, execution will be blocked that way. More questions? If not, let's thank the speaker. Thank you.